Hello, welcome to Don't Get Rusty, where we have fun talking about things to help keep you proficient. We have an exciting program today, which is handling emergencies with poise and aplomb. And we're going to be joined with, uh, of course, a regular group, but Chris Mosier is going to be presenting that to us. But before we make the introduction, Chris, let's move to the next slide. We, we just adore having feedback. We wanna hear from you. So okay. if you can see here, if you have the little questions tab, if you, ta uh, if you tap on that, you can send questions to our about, uh, many staff members in the back who are funneling us the questions and we will answer as many as possible actually on the webinar. Chris, next slide, please. Got it. Uh, so I am Keith West, and my, uh, my uh, position here at AOPA is I work with flight schools to help them to deliver a better flight training experience. And I am joined by, I'm gonna skip down to Pablo, our co colleague Pablo. Pablo, introduce yourself, buddy. Uh, hi, Pablo Morelia, Senior Director of Flight Training Technology. All things technology, you can fly for you. And I have the pleasure of always introducing our guest for this week, and it is my pleasure to introduce Chris Moser. From well, you thank you, Pablo. Well. Thank you so much, Pablo. And I, I really want to to uh, just express my pleasure at my esteemed colleague from Illinois and uh, the uh, esteemed colleague from South Carolina. I appreciate you guys being here with me. South Carolina. <laughs> South. Oh, are you North, North Carolina? Oh my God. Virginia. Oh, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Like okay. Yeah. I thought you were the Carolinas. Come on. Carolinas. Okay. Lump it all together. That's fine. Yeah, we'll call it the colony. All right. Yeah. Anyway, so um, my name is Chris Moser. I'm also a CFI, and I work at AOPA, like like these guys with uh, flight training and education. And uh, of course, we're joined by Stephen. Hello, everyone. <laughs> who's helping us behind the scenes and will be uh, uh, helping us with uh, getting your questions out. So please make sure you do ask questions as we go through and we'll yeah, do our I best. Got a, either I got a question. Answer. I got a question. Yes. Do, do we get wings credit for this? Why? I'm glad you asked Keith because it's, it's on our next question. slide. <laughs> so huh. let's go ahead and take a look at what we're talking about today. We're talking oh, about. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait, before that, I got another question. Is this going to be recorded? Like <laughs> if I have to drop off King, you know, is it going to be a recording? Yes. In fact, it is being recorded, and uh, what we'll do is is look for that uh, probably sometime tomorrow afternoon. Usually, when it gets posted, okay. we'll take the recording today, submit it, and then usually gets on to our uh, AOPA YouTube channel um, sometime tomorrow afternoon. So yeah, oh, you guys will be recorded. Great. Look for that. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So um, today what we're talking about is handling emergencies, as Keith said, with poise and aplomb, and uh, just the, just the basic structure of how we're going to discuss this. First, we'll talk about what we need to know. So what are the types of things that are useful for us to know? And then we'll talk a little bit about some suggestions overall for how we can practice emergencies and really keep ourselves um, not just you know, familiar, but really proficient with them. Uh, and then we'll uh, also talk about some suggested training activities. And these are all just meant to be sort of a, a jumping off point because I'm sure some of uh, you folks out in the audience will have some great ideas as well. And then of course the bonuses today is as long as you used your email, uh, give us your email when you registered for the webinar. Uh, that's the same one that you use with your FAA uh, account, the uh, WINGS account, you will get automatically get WINGS credit. So we will get that taken care of for you. So just make sure that you've given us your email that is the one that you use for your FAA account. So let's get started. First, Stephen, would you please roll the poll? And we want to take a look at how many times have you had an in-flight systems failure or emergency? Is it a never? Hopefully knock on wood. Is it one to two times? Maybe three to five? Or just so many you can't even think about it? It's, you know, it's like, scarred you hey chris hey yeah if i may do you have any handouts and if so where are those available very good we do have some handouts there's a couple of links that we'll mention during the presentation and you'll find those uh, i assume over on that sidebar there's a section called handouts and you can click on that and it's a pdf that you can then download uh, and get the couple of links that we're going to discuss that way you won't have to try copying anything down or trying to take screen grabs or that sort of thing wow did you did you do that handout yourself I know it's really visually uh, stunning, isn't it? <laughs> it's a it's a word document. <laughs> it's, oh, it's a word. So it's a word doc. Yeah, it just has the the things we'll talk about with the links just for your convenience. There, I think there's wow, four of them on there. Look at those numbers rolling in. It looks I like know. They... so. Let's check out what we got here. Yeah. So we've got uh, clear. We got 76% voting. We've got the results there. So the majority of us one to two times, which is. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of, I wish, I almost wish I would have asked how many hours we could compare with this, but how many hours we've got for flying. But one to two times, vast majority, then never, knock on wood. And then a few of us, very few, with uh, more than, say, one to two times. So any anything you guys have, too, on that? Uh, Q, 
Keith or Pablo, you guys ever had an well, emergency you know, helicopter? Like systems failures, you know, a number of those, maybe one thing that can be called like an actual emergency. Um, but it, anyway, we'll get into that later. Yeah, yes. I had a, my electrical system went out once. So yeah. but that was, I mean, that was with someone else, which is great. So they use their cell phone. I mean, there's all kinds of things we could do. So, you know, well, your, your cell phone, what'd you do? I cook it in the USB and it powered the <laughs> He's got the large not? battery. He's got the did, right. I've, well, I've got the big phone. The, uh, okay. It wasn't right. Max. Yeah, no, um, you know, I mean, Airplane that's how we called the tower. So it was good. <laughs> So, um, so what I wanted to explain was yes, and I've had uh, actually three electrical failures, tw two on the same day in two airplanes, one flight right after another. But uh, what I did want to share here is that um, you know we do some emergency stories, and uh, so one story that I wanted to just kind of relate, and it kind of leads into sort of what I hope is the moral for today, um, is that I I used to fly freight for a company out west, and I was flying a Beach 99, which is kind of like a stretched out King Air. And this is a you know a little bit of time doing that. And I was up at cruise. It was we used to take off early mornings, and I was over northern Arizona, over the mountains. And I'd been in cruise. I was on kind of a longer leg, just waiting to get to the next VOR. And yes, we didn't have GPS. And I remember as I was sitting there, just relaxed and chilled, um, both my engine fire lights came on. And so the immediate thing that happened was I went into like, <gasps> and then I remember I remember quickly looking at both engines left and right going like, are they actually on fire? And I, I, I remember being taught, if you have a fire, you pull these T handles and, and you know put the uh, fire extinguishers on, which is of course gonna shut your engines down. And you know, of course, what was running through my head as well as, my God, I hope they're not on fire because I'm over these mountains and there's no place to land and I don't wanna have to fly with no engines. So luckily what happened was that in that couple of seconds, that one, two, whatever, however many seconds it was that that initial sort of holy crap, this is happening thing kicked in, um, I my training then kicked in. And so I know follow procedures. And so then I started going through my checklist for it. And what happened was there was a switch. There was a little dial that we had on the airplane that you would use and you could rotate it to test mode, which would show all the lights. So you could test it during preflight to make sure all that the enunciator lights were working properly. It had vibrated down into test position because I, like I said, I'd visually looked and I didn't see anything wrong with either engines and all the engine instruments were okay. And so then I just put it back into the, the normal flight mode and everything was fine. But I can tell you that that little chill sort of being relaxed was gone for the rest of the flight. I was wide awake and very alert for the rest of the flight. And the point that I kind of wanted to make with this is that you will fly like you train. So luckily in that job, of course, I was flying every day and I did make a point of trying to review my emergency procedures because I wanted to be ready. And in that moment where had I not been prepared, where I could easily see how panic or sometimes um, other reactions might take over, in that case, the training took over. It's like I, I did, I went back to what I was taught to do. I went back to my training and followed procedure. So either Pablo or Keith, you have anything like that that you would see as the same sort of uh, lesson that you learned or? You mean like uh, an indication that you interpret it as an emergency or what? Right, anything like that or where you maybe had experience with something like that where a procedure well, took I'll, over I'll, in time I'll, of stress. I'll throw, I'll throw mine in later. Um, okay. you know, yeah, I had an actual failure, but uh, yes, let's, let's keep going here. All right, so what do you need to know then in order to be prepared? How do you, how are you prepared so that when things like this happen that you, that that training will kick in? Because of course, if you don't train for it, the training won't kick in. Who knows what you'll end up doing? And of course, uh, we'll talk later about accident case studies. You can see sometimes what people end up doing, which we're like, why did they do that? Um, so that I think one of the most, or some of the most important things are number one, systems knowledge. You need to know your systems. And I know sometimes when we're going through pilot training and we're learning, it's like we do it because we have to do it for the check ride or because our instructor makes us do it. But the real reason, and I'm hoping that a, a lot of you folks have already figured that out, is that knowing your systems knowledge helps you with emergencies because when you understand the system and then look at the emergency procedures, you'll gain a much deeper understanding of why you're doing that. And additionally, it adds into uh, helping you troubleshoot. When something's wrong, if you know how that system works pretty well, you can start to troubleshoot yourself and figure out what's the appropriate action to take here. Why is the checklist telling me to do this? And you can you can think about these things uh, as they're happening and, and sort of try to figure stuff out. Because of course, it's it's a whole different situation than like in a car where we can just pull over on the side of the road and then stare at it. We've got to do something when we're in the air to handle it and get it down safely. Well, so Chris, so somebody is asking, saying you might define system failures and emergencies. Do we do we want to do we want to talk about that for just like a second? I mean, like maybe what the difference is. You know, when does a system failure actually become an emergency? 
Right, and that's a little bit what we'll talk about on the next slide when we talk about um, when to declare an emergency or how to exercise your PIC authority. It's like, obviously, I, I would say that, I don't have an official definition here necessarily, but I would say that you, know, you can have a systems failure, um, for example, like we had these electrical fares. It, it sounds like we've all had them. And I know that all the ones that I had were during day VFR. So the engine's not gonna stop running. So when it comes down to it, was it really an emergency? I was in day VFR conditions. Not really, it was more of a, a just more of a, an, a nuisance in the sense of being able to communicate with ATC to get back to a towered field, which is you know where I was in all cases was flying to. Um, so I would say those are not emergencies. Clearly emergencies would be something like that's gonna affect the safety of flight. So if you have a full electrical failure um, in, and you're in the clouds, you're flying IFR, now that becomes an emergency, or if you have an engine failure or fuel starvation, that can become an emergency situation where now you're having to face potentially landing in a field somewhere or you're dealing with a fire, something that's really immediately let's, affecting your safety. Let's dive into this just a little bit because I was uh, giving a simulator flight to an instrument student this morning, and you know I did I failed his um, his vacuum pump, right? Is that an emergency? So are you asking my opinion on that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say that if you're in the clouds, you're in actual IFR and you're now flying partial panel, and I'm assuming you're talking about in a, like a steam gauge type of situation. I would say that for most people, yeah, that's an emergency because while we do learn how to fly partial panel, I mean, let's be honest about it. When you're actually out flying IFR, how many of us actually train regularly as, as much as we probably should on being proficient in partial panel? And, and so I would say that, that that can either is or is going to soon become one because you really need to get out of those conditions and get down to just minimize the risk that you're taking in controlling the aircraft on partial panel. Well, and so my student, he did declare an emergency, and I thought it was a good idea because, you know, when you're declaring an emergency, you just say, hey, I've got something that's happening here that's not normal, that's impairing my ability to control the aircraft, and maybe I need special consideration or handling, you know. It's not saying my wing fell off and, you know, I'm, I'm in this dire type situation. And right. and uh, I've been to a number of various, uh, like, you know, educational aviation events or whatever, and they'll ask how many people have declared an emergency, and a handful of hands will go up, and then they'll say, well, how many people did, did that come back on them? You know, did they have to fill out paperwork with the FAA? And nobody ever raises their hands. And right. I think the point I'm, well, I want to make here is that if you feel like you need that special consideration, don't worry about whatever consequences are. Declare the emergency as soon as you have, you know, some sort of issue and, and then worry about the consequences later because it's not likely that they're going to be consequences. All right. That's me exactly talking. right. And in fact, um, and we'll talk about that on this uh, this next slide coming up. We'll go into a little bit more detail with that. Oh, I'm, I'm just like one slide ahead of you. Bro. You are. Right? You're just you're thinking ahead. <laughs> you know, that's good because, Keith, because that really gets into anticipating what's going to happen. And that's one really right. good stuff to be prepared for emergency. So clearly you are, are ready to go. Um, so the next part is when you have your systems knowledge and, and so you've got to take that to a different level, though, than maybe during your training. It's not just about that I can diagram or I can identify the parts of an electrical system. It's really also knowing the practical application of what it looks like when things go wrong and then how to handle them. Like, what are you actually able to do in the cockpit? You're not obviously not going to be climbing out and pulling the cowl off to fix things while you're in the air. You need to know what can I do from within the cockpit for these controls that I do have uh, and to handle it. And then and like, like for example, with a vacuum failure, that's a, that's a great one for IFR students is what does it look like? Because we all know if you've done instrument training and seen a vacuum failure, it, that it's quite insidious. If there is no flag that comes down or if you don't notice that there's a vacuum failure, like there's no flag on the attitude indicator, then it's insidious in the sense that it'll start to drift and just slowly go. And you can actually watch that if you've got an old school attitude indicator. Um, when you shut the airplane down, just watch how long it takes to spin down. And so you won't notice it. And so you might get yourself in an unusual attitude before you realize it. Well, you know, so and, and that's a, go ahead. Oh, no, uh, sorry. I was just going to say, so declare any emergency, May Day, um, you know, when, where, differences. Yeah, let's let's do that on the next slide. So that's totally coming well, up. I, I want to I bring up a point, though, that you brought up about the insidious nature of it, because I think a lot of these emergencies don't look like what we're expecting them to look like. And, you know, there's this uh, uh, little thing that goes around Facebook before every summer talking about a drowning person doesn't look like what you think. You know, it's not somebody right. flailing. They're just kind they're of waving under the water. Well, it's kind of the same with the flying. You know, you talk about the attitude indicator just slowly going off. My emergency was that we lost a cylinder. OK, and so it was a 
a big pot and of course your heart jumps like that and then you're like all right the engine's still running you know how well am i doing here you know can i make it to my next airport and you know and it, it's really weird the ideas that you have in your mind and you know of course the answer was no because you know we expect when we have an engine failure for the prop to stop something like that but, you know that's not necessarily what it looks like right it could be a partial power situation for a bit and it's probably yeah. going to progress too and so it's and it's also that i think there's that human psychological aspect that we go to as well is that we hope that well it seems to be okay now we hope it's just going to work itself out and we can just keep going as normal we don't often don't want to accept the fact that something catastrophic or bad has happened and we're just hoping it'll just go away um rather than having to go through the thought of that we're in an emergency now Cool. All right. All right. Let's and then the, the last bit here on this slide, because we will talk about that PIC authority and when to declare as soon as we get to that, uh, the next one over here, is to memorize your procedures. Make sure you know your emergency procedures. If your airplane, like uh, 172s, for instance, are a pretty good example, they on the emergency procedures, they will have bolded items that are the memory items. So if your airplane uh, and your manual has memory items, you should definitely memorize those. If there are not any that are bolded, then go through and figure out which ones are memory items and really use your judgment here. For example, the 172 I mentioned has bold items, but there's one checklist that is not bolded in the 172 manual that I think everybody should memorize all of, and that's the engine fire during start. It does not have bold items on it, but really you should memorize that whole thing because if an engine fire happens during start, you are not gonna be pulling that checklist out. Um, it's like you're not going to have time. You're going to need to just know what to do, which is, of course, getting the fuel off, um, keep cranking it, and um, and just try to get the fire put out, uh, depending on what the situation is, whether the engine starts or not. So really sometimes. So And if you have an, a, like a checklist that doesn't have anything bolded, go through and highlight the ones that you think, what were the things that, based on my systems knowledge, maybe working with a CFI, what would be the things that would be really important for me to do from memory versus having the time to look at a checklist? So like an electrical failure, you actually have some time. If you notice it relatively quickly, which we'll talk about a little later how to do that, um, you can pull the checklist out and just work your way through it. You don't necessarily have to have all of it memorized. It's just more about identifying when it happens. And so you've got time. But for example, like an electrical fire, you need to know what to do right now to get the thing put out and then start going through the checklist for the items that follow it. All right, so, so you'll see on this slide, we are gonna talk about the PIC authority thing. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to mention is really developing some situational awareness habits. And the way that I do that, you'll see this, this picture here. This is a, a 172 cockpit. And I've got these arrows that show a flow. And this is the flow that I use for pretty much any 172 that I would fly. And you'll notice that it starts down at the fuel selector, which is right in between, you know, right on the floor uh, between the two uh, pilot seats. And then it comes up and I look at the trim tab. I'll go over to the flap indicator just to check to make sure that's where it is. And basically I just do this flow every time I've got a moment, you know, I've got, you know, I'm kind of finding myself that I'm chilling. I just want to monitor things. I'll just do this quick flow to make sure everything is where it should be. So I'll check the flaps, check the mixture. Like I just, I just pause and, and think, do I have it leaned? Is it set where I want it? Throttle, I'll check the RPM, make sure it's where it's, it should be. If I've got carb heat, is that on or off is appropriate? Check the breakers. you got your um, primer and the ignition come up, you've got your switches for the lights, so I'll pause, especially at different phases of flight, just when I level off for cruise, I'll pause and say, is it time to turn off the landing light, uh, and so on, and then work my way across the flight instruments, verifying that they're okay, and then I'll come down and I'll check all the engine instruments, looking for them to be in the green, and then potentially jumping over to the avionics as well, depending on the phase of flight. So I'm always, I always know that it's like, if I've got time, do a flow. It's like, and that way I can just keep an eye out, and the reason that I say this is that my first, uh, we'll call it emergency. I didn't declare an emergency, but my first uh, one that happened was when I was instructing, uh, we had gone out to a local field, we were out and I can remember I was there chatting away as I would, you know, in the sense of instructing and giving instruction and so on. And I remember thinking, wow, the radio sound funny. And I remember turning to my student going, did you hear that? And the next time we would have pushed the transmit button, boom, everything went dark. So what I now know, this was an S model 172. What I know now, looking back on it with systems knowledge, is that I am very sure that the voltmeter and the enunciator were probably on. I didn't notice them because I was too busy looking out for traffic, instructing. Um, and I didn't notice that we were already on battery power and we ran the battery all the way down to zero. So we had nothing, no electrical. Luckily, I had a handheld radio and I pulled that out and used it and we ended up going back and landing. And this is that same day where I had another electrical failure the next flight. And so it's that being aware. And so that really helped me to that, like that memory of mine helped put into my uh, sort of practice of pay attention, be vigilant. 
always be checking. And so what I often teach my students is that if you're up in cruise and you're just kind of relaxing, you're looking around, take that little moment of thinking, is everything still okay? Check the engine instruments, what's coming up next? So always be trying to stay ahead of the airplane um, while you're doing that, because otherwise it's really easy to miss things like that. And, and I'd say that from personal experience. So Keith, anything along those lines before we talk about the PIC stuff? No, you're doing a great job, keep rolling. All right. Well, actually, so let, me, next, let me ask something real right? quick, Chris. Is, um, someone says that uh, there's no clear definition of emergency that we've made. And it seems that to them, an emergency is a critical situation where safety of flight is dependent on the reaction to the situation. Um, I mean, sure, there's probably a clear definition of emergency, but I think when we're in that situation, we don't know what the situation is. Right. Well, so I, so, I don't think it is clear because it depends on um, where you are, who you are, you know, what your capabilities, what the airplane, um, what, what weather conditions. Um, so it, it, I would say that it's any time that you think you need help. And remember this, okay, you declare an emergency, the controller can't fly your airplane, you know. Right. It's, you know, so really, are you asking for something from ATC, you know, some sort of priority, like to get to the closest airport, you know, give me some sort of directions or right. I'm going down, come and find me, you know, so you got to you got to realize the limits of what the controllers would do, uh, Chris. And, and I would say absolutely that's the key. It's like, yeah, I'm, like I said, I think we actually did mention something, a definition along those lines when we were talking about that uh, just a few minutes ago. And I'd agree with that. That's a decent definition. Safety of flight, something needs to happen right now. And, and uh, to Keith's point, I completely uh, agree with you there as well, because, you know, if I'm out in the middle of really a really rural area, the only thing around is a non-towered field and there's nobody flying, me declaring an emergency, unless that I'm talking to ATC or I'm on 121.5 or something, and it's like other than telling them, hey, I've got an emergency, please come find me, which is what I would typically use it for, the emergency is not, declaring the emergency is not going to do a whole lot for you uh, in that situation. So like if I'm landing in a field, it's like the farmer's not going to know that I declared an emergency. But if I'm dealing with a situation where I need priority over other traffic, maybe even in a non-towered field or at a towered field, or I'm on with ATC and I need help and I need to be able to do what I need to do right now, because of course declaring the emergency clears the way for them to give us priority over all other aircraft, even those business jets that are coming in, that sort of thing. They're gonna get all those folks out of the way and let us have what we need and clear the runways, et cetera. So if that is where you're heading and that's the, the environment that you're in, then yes, you should declare an emergency. So I, I agree, it's just a situational thing, but I also agree with the fact that it's like, in the sense of, you know, should I be declaring an emergency because my landing light went out? That probably not. You know, that's that's not appropriate. Um, unless maybe it's at night and I'm dealing with some really weather, you know, really bad weather or something. Well, let me um, ask you this. Um, as ATC would do, we have a student pilot on the transmission, and they ask the question. So I, I think it's probably pretty good, especially for the student. He says, "I'm a student pilot, and I understand there are situations where you don't realize you need help and you fail to ask. But I'm confused why there's hesitation to get help when you think you might need it." I've heard tapes of conversations with ATC and a pilot from catastrophic accidents and ATC asks, are you declaring an emergency? And they say no. Yeah, that's it's often I think it's nervousness and fear. You're worried about whether it's being, um, I don't know, maybe embarrassed in some cases that maybe you did, maybe you felt like you made a mistake and it's your fault. Or it's I think it's fear of, of repercussions of filling out paperwork or getting in trouble somehow. I think that's I think the getting in trouble in the paperwork thing is probably the most common reasons that people tend to hesitate. They, they feel like if I do this now, I'm going to bring some sort of consequence on me in, in reality. Well, you know, it's if, a, if a controller is suggesting that you declare an emergency and, you know, sometimes they'll kind of do that. You know, you hear these tapes afterwards. Hey, you know, take the bait. Declare the emergency. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. And yeah. in fact, to that point, that there was a story. There was a, a, a colleague of ours at AOPA named Tom, and he actually he used to fly traffic watch out of Martin State Airport around Baltimore. And he said he took off one day. It was in a 182, and he of course he flew all the time. He took off one day and was climbing out, and had just gotten clear of the Delta airspace, and said the engine started running rough. He said rough enough that he was like he was worried, and so he immediately called back to Martin State and said, Martin State, this is Traffic Watch One. I'm coming back into land, and they could tell because they knew him. He flew there every day, you know, multiple times a day. And they said, is uh, Traffic Watch One is everything okay? And he's like, Yeah, I'm just having some trouble with my engine. And said, Traffic Watch One, do you want to declare an emergency? And there was silence on the radio, like he said nothing. And they came back and they knew who it was. They said, Tom, it's free, to your point, Keith. And he was like, okay, declare the emergencies. I said, do you want us to roll the trucks? He's, and, and they said, it's free too. Okay, roll the trucks. And he said, he, he gets down and lands and the trucks all rolled out and everything turned out okay. 
but it was that same hesitation. Here he was, he had a real emergency, but he was like hesitant to do it. Um, and so if you need it, if you need that priority, you need the help, do it. You know, it's, it's, that's what it's there for. Um, don't, don't be afraid of doing it. But I know from my own experience, I got in two situations where I was dealing with icing and it's like, I, in fact, one case I was uh, flying along, it was in Arizona and we had this one layer of clouds in the winter time and ATC, I was on with center and ATC happened to put me at an altitude where I was in it. And as I entered it, I saw ice building up on my, I was flying a Piper um, Lance at the time and ice was building up and this airplane's not certified for icing. And ATC was talking to somebody and it was almost like they were having a conversation about something and I couldn't get through. So I just put the power and I just climbed up a thousand feet to get out of it because I was getting ice. And they came back on and said, uh, M flight, you know, whatever I was, M flight one or three or four or whatever, do you, is everything okay? And I said, yeah, I was picking up ice, I had to get out of it. They were like, oh, okay. Now, if you think about that, did I violate a reg? Yup because I was on an IFR flight plan. I was on a flying IFR and I busted altitude, but it's like, I couldn't get through. I needed to tell them. And so I just did it. And that kind of gets to my point of don't be afraid to exercise your PIC authority because could I theoretically have gotten violated? Yes, I could have, but they just said, oh, okay. Is that altitude going to work for you for the rest of the way? I was like, yes, it will. Okay. Just maintain that altitude. That's all that happened. So I'm not saying to not ignore them, but in that case, I couldn't get through and I was able to get myself out of the situation. So don't be afraid to use your PIC authority, because as I well, was Pablo or Keith mentioned earlier, that ATC is not flying the airplane for you. They're not in there with you. So it's up to you to maintain safety of that flight. And if it means declaring an emergency, then do it. Do whatever you need to do to make sure the flight is safe. Will we be covering squawk codes as well? And um, I was not planning on covering squawk codes, but of course there are the three. Keith, help me out, because I didn't go and look up. We had uh, 7,700 7, for loss of comms. I said emergency, sorry, 7,700 for emergencies. 7,600 um, is loss of comms. Yeah, loss of comms, and then 7,500 for if you get hijacked. By the way, sort of random trivia thing here, I was uh, out in Arizona, the same place where I had that electrical failure, Falcon Field in Arizona, and um, we had landed and, and uh, we had forgotten to put the flaps all the way up as we were taxiing. And so then I found out that taxiing with your flaps down is also a sign of hijacking. So ATC called us and asked. They were like, is everything okay? <laughs> like, because your flaps are down. Why are and you I was like, oh, yeah, we forgot to put them up. They said, by the way, that's a sign for hijacking, just so you know. So so is it hijacking if I'm like on a trip and somebody has to go to the bathroom, so I have to land early, they're hijacking my flight? Is Absolutely, because that's annoying, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your flight has been hijacked. All right, and the one other tip I wanted to make here was that really take time to think ahead through scenarios think you know for example in the electrical checklist if you have an electrical failure one of the things if you can't get that alternator reset to start working again it says you know start only use minimal equipment well what does that mean because there's no guidance in in your flight manual you've got to think about what is drawing power and what do i actually need so for example i can tell you from experience that transmitting on the radio draws a lot of power so what you may want to do is think ahead of time go through and you can look at your breaker panel and tell like how many amps does each of these pieces of equipment pull and think what if i was in that situation and various situations if i'm flying in the clouds or if i am i in day vfr or if i'm flying at night what equipment do i need to keep on for the electrical for instance and so what would i be willing to turn off and um, in case I had one electrical failure that happened, and so we asked ATC, like, hey, is it okay if we just turn our transponder off? You got us on radar. Can we just turn us off? We were heading back to Charleston, West Virginia uh, on that flight. What, what are all these, uh, you know, I keep, like, we've been looking at this slide forever, and, you know, I'm seeing these air, big arrows. What, yep. what is that? What are they? That was the flow that I mentioned earlier. So it's the, it's the flow that I follow in a 172, where I start at the fuel selector and work my way up here to the flaps and, and the, the engine controls and across, looking at the breakers, switches, up uh, to check the master switch and, and the, the switches here, like avionics and lights across the flight instruments and then down the stack here for you know, I can tell from this picture why you keep losing your electrical system. You don't have the alternator on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true, isn't it? <laughs> or this picture, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Can ATC declare an emergency for you? Yes, they can. Yeah. Although we did have a situation at Frederick uh, not that long ago where someone was coming in and ATC kept, I know what it was that they, they were trying to get the person to, to request special VFR. And I guess that they can't do that for you. ATC is not allowed to, to give you special VFR. And they kept suggesting like, do you want something special <laughs> <laughs> for that? Yeah. The guy just wouldn't right. do it, unfortunately. Hey, so to go back to the original question, we never covered May Day. Is Wait, let's roll, the let's roll the poll and let people take the poll while we're talking yeah. about this, how yeah. about that? 
All right, so this one, how often do you practice emergency procedures? Do you do it every flight, periodically, during, just during my flight review, or I just don't do it enough in general? Um, so yeah, so the, the May Day, so you've got the two calls you can make. If you need to kind of break through radio chatter or something, you can, of course, say May Day, May Day, May Day, and then say what it is. You're kind of breaking into a frequency or breaking through the chatter. Um, or you can also use Pan Pan if you have it's more of a like a I've got a problem I I need urgent help but it's not quite an emergency yet so you can say pan pan so was there any more to that question than just what those are or uh, well, no, you know, no, and I, I want to point out that you know a lot of these procedures are from the days of like um, of yore, and so you you there were not many people on the radio. I mean, you know, a lot of the the modern environment where there's constant chatter back and forth between the aircraft and the controllers, you really don't have to go mayday, mayday, mayday to get their attention. All you have to just say is, you know, I'm declaring an emergency, and right. that's going to do the job for you. Yeah. So if you need, it. and like I said, it's a, it's you can you can use it if you like. Um, okay, let's take a look at the poll. Hey, so, let's look at the results uh, here. While we're there, sorry to continue to go back to this, but you needed extra content anyway, Chris. Um, <laughs> Did I? I've got more. <laughs> <laughs> so someone asked a good question about uh, where to declare the emergency. They were asking if they should do it on CTAF if you're at non-towered airport, um, or is there another specific place? All right. So I would say that if you're at a non-towered field, and especially if there's potentially or you know that there's other traffic in the pattern, yeah, declare it on CTAF uh, because that way you can get other people to go around or get out of the way so you can land. So you let them know, like, I've got an emergency, like I've got to land. Um, in the case that you are like on with flight following or at a towered field or you're just talking to ATC or you need to get to ATC, like if I was gonna land out in the middle of a field somewhere, I would either already be half tower, like a lot of times I'll keep Frederick's frequency in um, on the radio just while I'm flying because if I'm not gonna be going to another airport, we're just out in the practice area, I just have it there. So I would call them and let them know. And the main thing that I wanna do is I've already got the frequency tuned up. I already know who it is. And that way I can know that I can talk to somebody and tell them where I am so they can start calling emergency services for me. Um, and so in the case of like fi flight following, I've talked to whomever, whomever I'm talking to. So that's why I like to use flight following personally on cross countries or if, if you're talking to ATC, just let them know like what's going on. And I like having that radar contact for that reason. They know where I am. I'm having an emergency, I'm going down so you can see exactly where I am. And so hopefully they can start sending some help out for us. So and how's that poll thing? going? Mm -hmm. So the poll looks like check, check it out. We've got how often do you practice emergency procedures? And we have the vast majority, 51% saying periodically there, and then 29% not enough. And then a few we got there saying only during my flight review, and then just 5% saying every flight. And that's one of the things I wanted to do is give you some tips on how you can do it more often without necessarily disrupting what you normally would be doing. Um, and that's the, kind of one of the things I talked about. How about you guys? You got about the same? How often do you guys practice your emergencies? Well, I do it a lot because I have students, but <laughs> yes. and, and that helps. We're often, yeah. Actually, usually we are the emergency, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, I don't. I don't okay, so maybe so, Pablo yeah, will give you some tips too. Questions <laughs> such as this keep coming up and they say, what do you suggest um, in the case of an electrical failure when you have a 150 with fuses and talking about troubleshooting? Okay, and you just I think a little bit of context really helps because unless you're at night or in IMC, electrical failure, I mean, declare an emergency if you need to, but it's 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 a problem, you know, it's a it's a pretty big inconvenience, but you're not going to fall out of the sky because you have an electrical failure. So, and say focused on uh, flying the airplane, just like we had a, one earlier, um, an earlier webinar where the door pops open, you know, that's definitely not an emergency. I mean, right. flying the airplane. So don't let something build up and distract you in your mind when it's really just an inconvenience. Okay. Exactly. So, I, and I um, Sorry. So we're, we, you know, just to kind of round out the emergencies, uh, can you just give a quick idea as to what happens after you declare the emergency in the sense of both um, what happens at the airport or with ATC and afterwards, after you land? Paperwork. Sure. Are, you, are you run through the system and do they revoke your certificate and you can never be a pilot? <laughs> right. So to, to, to that point, um, number one, in the air, now you're getting priority. Now they have, it gives ATC, actually what you're doing is giving ATC power and you're giving them the power to clear everybody else out of the way, IFR traffic out of the way, everybody else out of the way to let you get what you need. So in other words, to clear the runways and let you pick any runway at whatever airport you need, you now have access to that. Whereas normally you would have to do the normal part of waiting and turn and so on. So by declaring an emergency, you're allowing them to clear all that out for you so that you can get priority and get down on the ground and end the flight safely. Um, when it comes to landing on the ground, it's like, you know, 
the people that I've spoken with, I've not had to de declare the emergency yet because um, it's worked out. Like I, I just gave a couple of the stories of things that have happened to me. It's like, and I was able to, to, to do them. But like for Tom, when he had that thing with the engine out, nothing. Nobody, it's like the FAA could come and ask you to fill out paperwork or ATC, they could ask you to fill out paperwork, but nothing happened. They, there was no paperwork, there was nothing. And getting in trouble, unless you were violating some reg willfully somehow, and I don't mean as part of the emergency, because during the emergency, you are allowed to go wherever you need to go. You need to land in a restricted area, then go land in a restricted area. Um, but in, in the case of that, nothing, there's, you're, you're not gonna get in trouble for declaring an emergency um, in that case. So it's okay to do it. It's the biggest thing is we hesitate because I think, like I said, I think we're afraid of things happening and these things are not gonna happen. The worst you're gonna have to do is probably fill out a report. I had one time I had a, um, uh, a student that was solo and they uh, damaged an airplane slightly on a landing. And so we had to fill out NTSB stuff. The biggest pain in the butt was filling out the report. You know, it's like, in, but I'd much rather be doing that on the ground, filling out some paperwork than, than uh, worrying, you know, than having some bad outcome on the flight instead. Okay. Right. Let's talk a little bit about how we can practice. What are some things that we can do to help us practice more regularly to make it part of our normal flying? Um, one of the things I would say is that you can run your procedures regularly, both in the airplane and on the ground. So I know that, that uh, Keith, you had mentioned, and, and you may elaborate on this uh, in a bit here, but you talked about having an emergency of the day when you were in the Navy, right? And so what you could do is do that for yourself. Say, I'm gonna practice every time I fly, you know, I'm going to do one emergency. I'm going to review at least one emergency before I do it. So maybe before I start the engine, I think to myself, hey, what is my engine start, you know, the uh, engine fire and start checklist and run through that. I used to do this when I was flying, especially when I was flying freight. I would do it on the way to the airport. I would go through, especially I was flying uh, multi-engine airplanes. I would go through my engine out on takeoff procedures because I wanted to make sure it was fresh in my mind. And I would review those kind of things. And then sometimes in cruise, I would pull one out and just review it just to, to try to stay current on it. So there are times when we definitely... Uh, can do this chair flying it too having a poster of your cockpit um, if you've got that and just kind of going through that is a really powerful way to to keep yourself prepared and just make a habit of it so it doesn't mean you have to do all of them all the time but try to go through a regular rotation of i'm going to review these things um, another one is to seek training with a cfi or other experienced pilots especially ones that fly that particular airplane that's a great way because they'll be able to tell you oh i had this situation happen and here's how i handled it um, and then here's a good way to practice or they can simulate what happened for you and let you work your way through that process. So, um, and to that point, using the flight review, not just as I've got to do this every two years for this minimum hour of ground, hour of flight thing, but actually using it to help you become proficient. Think about what airline pilots have to do. You know, when I was flying freight, it was the same thing. We flew every day. I flew every day, multiple hours a day. And every six months I had to go back in for training, recurrent training, where they would review all this stuff with us. So use the flight review um, you know, at the minimum every two years, if you don't maybe do it more often and do some, talk to your CFI and say, I want to review emergencies. Can you help me with some of these situations and give me practical situations of how this would happen, not just going out and doing steep turns and stalls and so on. Like, I really want to focus on this. And a great way to do that, to help you with that, is the uh, AOPA Air Safety Institute. And I've got a link for this on the handout. Uh, it's the Focus Flight Review. And they've gone through and created several lists of things where they've got ASI courses and videos that are listed for the ground prep part. And I'm gonna tell you right now, these definitely take more than an hour of ground, an hour of flight. But you've got these focus ones that focus on using systems, which is effectively those systems emergencies we talked about, positive aircraft control, which is meant to help address things like loss of control accidents that happen, um, weather and sea fit, sort of getting into the IFR, and they've got several other ones as well that you can check out. So I would just recommend those. Keith, did you wanna mention anything too about the Navy training or some of the stuff that you've experienced? Well, you know, um, something I like to do to, to keep it like top of mind is uh, I, I read the stuff, you know, I mean, like we have in our magazine, it's never again or flying magazine. I learned about flying from that. And, you know, then they'll have accident reviews. I read all that stuff and, you know, and things I had never even thought of, you know, comes mm -hmm. to mind and you see how other people are able to uh, to handle their events. And it, uh, it, it just kind of to me, it just keeps it top of mind. Cool. I'll tell you what, um, the ASI videos, those are like situations you sit there and go, oh, wow. And then you just keep going, well, I wonder, and they answer that question. I mean, that's good. But the NTSB ones, those can be dry, but I read some of those reports too, you know, depending on what the situation is. I mean, it's funny, usually it's based on things that happen nearby, right? Because it's kind of like, oh, when they called the DuPage Tower, they called Chicago Trade Con, I'm like, oh, okay. And then they were over Crystal Lake, you know, and you're like, 
so it kind of puts you in that situation of, oh, yeah. I've flown over there. I wonder what I would have done. <laughs> and so, a lot of those I know are available like free online. I know mm -hmm. that um, like flying, I think the Air Safety Institute stuff is free to anybody, not just members. So the Air Safety Institute yeah. stuff, if you get our magazines, that's a great thing too, as I know our magazines feature like one of those a month. There's a regular right there. I'm going to do one a month. I'm going to read the one that's in the magazine. Mm -hmm. um, I know the Flying Magazine, which uh, often is, is pretty widely distributed too, I think they've got a column like that as well. So take advantage of those and, and review them. It's a great way to do it. And I've got a link that we'll talk about in another slide coming up that has that on it as well. Ah. Um, make reviewing procedures a regular part of your flying. So here are, these are just two, and this is not the only by any means, but these are two things that I like to do to prepare, my, prepare myself and to stay current. Landings, power off, I, like doing my commercial certificate. Actually, I shouldn't say that. When I did my commercial certificate, we didn't have to do power off 180s. But later, of course, I had to teach them. And I now teach those to private pilot students too. I think that is one of the best exercises to pull the power, beam your landing spot, and glide it all the way in, and not just make the runway, but make it to your spot. What amazing training that is. And we can do that every flight. Every time you're on downwind, is, of course, as long as there's not traffic in the way, um, you, you can request a short approach and practice doing these power off landings. What a great practice tool. And it is then something you can apply like in the graphic here to um, to using, you know, when you have to do the engine out over a field, because now you already know what it looks like. You know how to glide. You know how well your airplane glides and what those, what those angles look like. Hey, Chris, Another we have too, a go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, we have a comment from David. He says he's a, a student pilot and that his flight school lets him sit in the airplane and go through, you know. Perfect. That is perfect. Exactly. And, it. you know, one of the things that you learn when you become a flight instructor, because you have a whole lot more time to look at stuff, you'll see <laughs> you'll see switches that you never knew of before. Because, you know, when you're training or you're flying, you're concentrated on just a few things. But the more you time you spend with it and the more familiar you get with it, the more you're going to be able to respond to to situations. In fact, Keith, that reminds me of the point that you made uh, yesterday when we were chatting about what, what's what's one of the major advantages of having a CFI with you? Is that remember we yeah. said that they catch all they're going to oh, catch right. everything because <laughs> we have all kinds of time to see switches that weren't done properly and everything else because that's all we have to do is sit over there and watch these things. So take yeah. a CFI with you. It's a great way to get safer. <laughs> um, so the takeoff briefing is another thing that I really think is important to do. And this is something that really got drilled into me. I mean, I learned it before flying powered airplanes, but flying gliders. Because in a glider, one of the things you have to deal with is when you're launching, there's the rope break issue. If the rope breaks, you've got to be ready to turn around and what altitude do I do that? And we'll talk about the impossible turn a little later here. But the takeoff briefing, before you get onto the runway and before you go power up, make sure you're doing a takeoff briefing and review every possible thing that could go wrong. So if I have trouble, before, like if I'm accelerating and I've not left the ground, what am I gonna do if something's abnormal? And of course you go pull the power max brakes. If I've lifted off and I've got runway remaining, what am I gonna do? If I've lifted off and I don't have runway remaining, but I'm below a certain altitude, what do I do? And then if I'm above a certain altitude, you know, when will I potentially turn back around um, to do the impossible turn, the quote unquote impossible turn to go back and land? So use that. And one of the things I do is I have adopted and started training the glider call out, which is we say the, when we reach that altitude for turnaround, we think about three things. I say 1,000 feet, nose down, turn left. I've already thought about which way is the wind blowing because I want it to go into the wind so it doesn't blow me downwind and turn back around. So it's like I make that a call out now. 1,000 feet, nose down, turn left. I've already thought about what I'm going to do. And the thing that I like to do is not in a morbid way, but I like to get myself into the mindset of it's going to happen. And so when it happens, this is what I'm going to do because I'm hoping to shave some of those seconds of the, oh, oh my gosh, this is happening right now. Is it real? I'm hoping that I can get myself mentally through that. So when it does happen, if it ever happens, but when it does, that I'm ready. I'm, I already know what I'm going to do. I've got a plan. Hey, Chris, uh, within the next five minutes, we would like to go to being able to answer questions and things like that, open it up. So just yeah, let's say oh, we're, uh, we're almost there. Real quick, go back to the last slide. Okay. So uh, someone asked, in this situation here, uh, you're practicing it, but if you went to the left, wouldn't it be a better sight, eyesight for doing that because it's on your, your side instead of on the opposite side? I think potentially yes, because you, you'll be able to see the pilot side. Of course, this is for me because I sit on the right side. But um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but no, um, really, what's going on here is my guess would be this is obviously at a non-towered field, you, and if you're going to practice this overfield, this is a graphic I just pulled out of Flight Training Magazine um, that 
that make sure they're probably doing it on the side of the pattern is why they're doing it that way. So they happen to be coming from the non-side pattern side and then went over to the pattern side to do these. You can do this, but just make sure you're really careful and make sure you're very clear on the radio what's happening so that if there is any traffic that could come into the area that they clearly know what you're doing. Because obviously we know we typically do not want to be descending down into the pattern. Uh, but yeah, it's like I like to do the power off 180 and then I'll do the circling thing usually out of the field. But if you've got a field that you know you can safely do this, it's really a good exercise to be able to circle down and actually land on the runway. Okay, let's go to this next slide here. Um, the simulator is one of the most powerful ways. And in fact, I know my students, when we do emergency day in the sim, it's always this ugh because it's like constant failures. And one of the things that a sim is amazing for is like, especially I know that ones that are running X-Plane, I know that they can do this. I know that you can do some failures in pretty much all of them, but X-Plane particularly had one where you can fail the flight controls. You can fail the elevator or the ailerons. And I actually learned a ton from working with a student doing that because we figured out like, what are you gonna do if the aileron fails? And, and probably the most powerful one was, what are you gonna do if you need to land without an elevator? And when you look at the elevator control cables, like on a 172, there's two cables. So it's more likely that you're gonna lose just one of them, not both. And what we figured out was by using the trim tab, you can actually trim the uh, trim tab so that it pulls the way that you normally would not be able to actuate with one of those broken, and then just use pressure. And basically the elevator acts almost like it, it wasn't broken. You can actually adjust it so that that can happen. Of course, if you lose both cables somehow in a catastrophic elevator failure, that's a different situation, but you can actually practice these things down to a landing in the sim, which of course is the one where you bring it into a glide and then at the last moment you're trimming up to try to flare it. And it's gonna be a, not gonna be a pretty landing, but it, you'll, you'll get out of it safely, I would imagine. So you can practice all kinds of stuff in the sim, whether it's partial panel IFR, drilling procedures is amazing for that, just to go over and over and over again very, very quickly. Um, and then uh, just doing different scenarios. So a great way to practice. Let me just get to this so we can get to some questions here too. Other training ideas, want to recommend there is a article that's a link on our handout for the impossible turn. Of course, that's the one where if you lose the engine on climb out and it gives a great way to practice that. So check out that article. I do this all the time with my students now and that's how I determined that I would turn around at you know, a thousand feet or whatever it is. You can find the altitude for your airplane with some safety buffer in there for knowing how to do it. Uh, and I found too, it doesn't specifically say this, but I find for me in a 172, actually doing a steeper turn. So almost 45 degrees of bank helps me lose less altitude, but I also know exactly what it feels like if I were to do that. So check it out and see what you'd be comfortable with and how much altitude you would want to have before you would even consider turning around. And then as Keith mentioned earlier, the accident case studies, never again from AOPA sources, there's lots of others, but there's, there's links on the handout to get to those uh, resources as well. And I know there's more on our site and I know there's more out there. And then the last one was um, simulated emergencies. And so this one is uh, Rob Machado, I think it's in our, our uh, CFI eFERC, has two videos that he made. And, and so there are creative ways that you can simulate using a, with the help of a CFI or an experienced pilot to simulate emergencies. And one that he does, or two that he does, is one, he does the ever lowering ceiling. So you've gotten yourself into bad weather, simulated of course. And then what he'll do is he'll say, okay, now your ceiling's at 3000 feet. And every couple of minutes he says, now the ceiling is lowered to 2500. And, and has the pilot work through the situation of they're having to fly lower and lower and still be able to navigate to get where they need to be. So that's a, that's a really creative way to do a simulated kind of a low ceiling, almost um, VFR into IMC scenario. And then another one he does is partial power. He says, like you said, oftentimes engine failures like Keith's is not gonna happen necessarily always catastrophically engine out. So maybe it's just reduced power. And so he'll start where he'll start to pull it back to like in a 172. Now all you have is 2000 RPM. And now the engine, and like in every couple of minutes, now all you have is 1800 and so on. You work your way down to, to get out of the situation. Can you make it back to the airport? Do you need to put it down in a field? Um, those kind of things. So just some really creative ways to make these things happen. All right. Those are the two things I mentioned, and here we go. Now we have time for questions, everybody. Hey, Chris, I'm gonna bring up, a number of people keep asking how you find the handouts, and it depends on what platform that you're using to see this, but if you just have a little strip with like a microphone, et cetera, et cetera, you can expand that, and there will be a, a, a series of boxes, and if you touch handouts, it will allow you to download um, the handout from there. And it looks like I'm, I'm looking at ours, at least on my menu here, and it's, there's both a Word and a PDF there. Okay, good. I, they're both the same, so either one of those will work, whatever works for you. All right, so Pablo, you're our, you're our question man. Do you have some questions lined up for us? I do. Um, a lot of statements, though, which is interesting. Uh, a lot of people with uh, ways to remember, you know, 7,500, 7,600, so I'll start with that since great segue. Oh, that would help me. 
So this is funny. I like this one. Uh, so for 75, 76, 77, in that order, it's hijack. I can't talk now. Have an emergency. <laughs> That's cool. I like that. So hi, H-I, Jack. 7,500 starting the lower, I right? Like, I said, I'm going to use that. Hi, Jack. If you can't talk, I'll have an emergency. That's good. I love it. That's great. Yeah. Because we had a couple others. There was one for emergency. I was something like going to heaven. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> That's not an emergency. That's a whole different level of issue. <laughs> All right. So um, we got uh, someone asked. You mentioned earlier about something with emergency procedures monthly. And they thought it was a publication you were talking about, so they asked if you could just, uh, you know, redo that, talk about that a little more. Sure. Um, so what I actually meant by that was that in AOPA's magazines, and not only our magazines, like in Flight Training and in AOPA Pilot, but also in other magazines too. I know that, for example, I know one other one that I happen to be familiar with is Flying Magazine. They typically have a column in there where they will review an accident. So that's what I meant was that you could make it at a minimum that I will review some accident study at least once a month. And so those magazines are one way that you could cure yourself. Oh, I got my new magazine. That cues me to remember, go review the emergency case study that's in there. And of course, our Air Safety Institute puts out some amazing videos uh, on uh, uh, real accidents that happen as well. And they've got a podcast series too, which I believe is the Never Again one that I mentioned. Cool. Okay. Um, you talked about a sim that does scenario training. Uh, can you go a little more info on yeah. either yeah, if there's only one? There. If there's yeah, I was trying to create it. No, there's not necessarily one sim. This is really about being creative. So what you could do, um, um, we, we've got access to a couple of different types of simulators uh, where we have our, in our, our flight uh, department area and so that what you can do is take accident case studies and you know this is where it's good to have a creative CFI but you can take actual accident case studies and put yourself in that situation set the weather up the way it was in the accident and then see if you can work your way out of it um, I also know that I think it was NAFI and it was at the EAA at Air Venture that um, can you help me Keith do you remember the name of the the tent that they did the proficient pilot pilot proficiency center Yes, they, and that was in, in um, uh, sort of working with Redbird, I know. They had a bunch of scenarios that they set up too. So you might be able to look online. I, I Unfortunately, I don't have that with me. I don't have that necessarily. I don't have access to that right now. But they that's an example where they had a whole bunch of scenarios that you could go and fly. And they would tell you how to set sort of like what the conditions were. So you could just be creative and then put yourself into some situations, kind of look at what are the things that where people get themselves in trouble and see if you could work your way out of it. And that can include systems failures, which are very easy to do in the sim, and then setting up the weather and the conditions. And you're going to probably want to see if either with you or if you've got your home sim, have somebody help you that can then run it and potentially lower the weather conditions and, you know, and make it more challenging so that you can kind of simulate what happened. And so that is one of the more difficult things about a simulator. It, they don't really come with prepackaged scenarios that you can just dial up. And so you, you like Chris says, you, you have to be creative and you have to work, you know, build a situation and work, talk with your a flight instructor. And maybe they can do that for you. Um, now, one thing I will say, I don't know about X-Plane and it doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't do it, but I do recall in the old, this the old versions of Microsoft Flight Sim. I have not had the opportunity to, to mess with the new one, but I do recall there being challenges uh, in some of those simulators. And so I, I think there may be some where they give you some of these harder things, but the biggest thing you can do is you set yourself up for, you know, look at an accident case study and you can do it yourself. But there are sometimes some out there that they'll have a sort of a starting situation, like here you are, go, see if you can get yourself out of this. Oh, here's, here's, here's one that popped up. It says, before you land off field, we're supposed to open a door. How much drag does it produce? None, don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> you got bigger problems. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. exactly. And the biggest thing is just trying to get it popped open so that, of course, it doesn't get stuck, you know, if you land hard um, or that the airframe gets bent as you're rolling out or whatever. So, yeah, yeah, don't worry about that. I'm trying to think. It's like I've actually, let me think about that. Um, I've actually had a door come open. We had that also that the, uh, the, uh, the guest we had on uh, some time ago, too. And I don't remember them saying anything about aircraft performance. He could just feel the oscillation because that jacket was hanging out of the door, the oscillation over the elevator. But... Yeah, I don't think it's enough that you're going to worry too much about so it. Here, here's a question that I have some experience with. It says, if there's no other traffic, would a Class C tower allow you to practice a turn back to the runway after takeoff? I haven't yes. done it in Class C, but I have done it in Delta a whole lot. I mean, yep. if there's a bunch of people out there, no, that's probably not good. But, you know, go early in the morning, and sure, they're happy to uh, to let you practice something like well, that. Well, the other thing, morning. too, is ask. 
Yeah, yeah exactly. Just ask. I, I mean, it's almost like the emergency thing. Don't be afraid. They're not gonna. They're not gonna get in trouble. The worst they can say is no. We're too busy. Exactly. That's exactly it. The worst they'll say is no. In fact, I found that the best days for that are on the days where it's a little dreary because there's not a lot of people flying. And so you got the ceiling high enough that you can safely be in the pattern. And I've got, I remember in Arizona one time, we, we had what's called Arizona IFR, that's one cloud. Um, but we had a day where it was kind of like an overcast day and nobody was flying because they were also used to just perfectly clear VFR. And so I went out with, a, it was another instructor actually, and I went out and we just ended up, there was, it was calm winds. The, the uh, tower let us go back and forth on the runway. We didn't even have to like fly a pattern. We would literally take off, climb up, do the engine out, come back, take off, do it again and come back. And we just, just went back and forth the whole time. We did it for probably half an hour. Um, so yeah, just ask. There, you'd be amazed with that. There's a guy that does that at Frederick almost every morning. He, he lands on every runway. Is that the guy with the uh, the, the, the aerobatic plane, like a decathlon or something? <laughs> yes, yeah, some kind of sort of tail dragger like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. All right. What else we got, Pablo? Well, now this one, um, this person made a statement that I wanted to bring up because I have my opinions on it. I won't give them until I offer it up, though. So this person says, I would add any time, if this is about when to declare an emergency. Uh, he says that any time you're outside, operating outside FARs, it's an emergency. Well, I guess I'd want to qualify that is that a willful, like, I just want to get away with something. I'm assuming it's because I've got to do something for safety of flight that takes me outside of the FARs. Then but I would say that's you pretty broad, though. Yeah, it's very broad. But I, I would mean, say that if if I'm assuming that, for everything. yeah, in the spirit of what we're talking about, I'm assuming they're saying that if you're outside of the FARs because of a safety of flight issue that you know you're operating outside of the regs or you're going to break a reg um, because you have to for safety of flight, then declare an emergency, of course. But if you're doing it just because you're trying to do something fun, quote unquote, then that's not an emergency, obviously. <laughs> um, okay. Do, do, do. All right, so I mentioned the hijack. Okay, um, what when you declare the emergency? We covered like the kind of the after and all that stuff. But what kind of things will be replied if you were to declare an emergency at that moment? What will ATC say? Mm -hmm. They're gonna they're gonna ask you number one, what do you need? And then they're gonna ask you about the whole thing of souls on board and and you know potentially how much fuel do you have? And don't feel like you know if you're too busy to answer those questions. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. well, you know, the priority is aviate, fly the airplane. In fact, it was the movie, A Miracle on the Hudson, Miracle, whatever. The, mm -hmm. uh, ATC was doing some of that stuff with them too. And you'll notice in some cases, they just didn't answer. They, they, were, they were busy flying the airplane. That's the priority. So don't worry about it. Yeah. But yes, yeah, so that, they're going to ask you that kind of stuff. How much fuel you have on board, I believe. And, and uh, that's for the, the emergency services and how many souls yeah. on board. Yeah. And I think that's another one of those things where don't be afraid of what they might ask. Declare the right. damn emergency. And like you yeah. said, Chris, you could say, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. the Give first thing they're going to ask you that you should answer is <laughs> what do you need? It's like, you know, and you got to tell them yeah. I need yeah. this. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, do you think it's dangerous to practice turn backs solo or would you recommend it do it with a CFI? Oh, geez. Do it with the CFI. Yeah, I would, and it, it would depend, Chris, depend on your experience level and everything too, but it's always safer to have another pilot backing you up. I mean, <laughs> most CFIs probably won't even do it. I mean, you know, it's something that you have to get comfortable with, and, right. and I would not try, try it myself without somebody who had done it before the first time. And then the first, other thing too that I would say is the, the, probably the best thing that you can do, and I, I would do this with a CFI too, because they can give you tips and, and help you with it, but do the thing in the article, the impossible turn, because it has you do it safely at altitude. There's a way to simulate that. Uh, and they basically what happens is you set up um, in a VY climb, just like take off, you're up at you know, a safe altitude, just like if you were doing stalls. You set up in the climb, you pull the engine, you count the five, so one, 1,000, two, 1,000, and so on, to simulate the, the oh crap factor, like is this really happening? Then you go to best glide and you turn it around and you see, you have to note the altitude when you pull the engine. So maybe I'm at 3,500 feet and I note that altitude and then I see how much altitude I lose by the time I do a 270 degree turn. And the reason for the 270 is that when you go back to the runway, it's more than a 180 because now you've also got to do a 45 to line back with the runway and a 45 to to um, you know to get on center and then a 45 to actually line up and that'll give you a really nice conservative number on how you much know, altitude you lose. 
That's great. And you know, another way to do it is with a simulator. I mean, yep. when we first got our Redbird, I said we had a contest, everybody seeing what it took to make it back to the runway. And you know what yes. we discovered is, is that as long as you don't stall the thing and, and, and you're able to get the turnaround, you're going to be fine. You know, yep. um, land it on the grass if you need to. It doesn't mean you have to get on the runway either. Just some place where there's not like for oh, us taking off yeah. on two, three, we have a quarry and a busy highway. I don't really want to land there if I don't have to. Right. So, well, yeah. you can't extend your glide. You just can't. There's only so much energy on the airplane and you know pulling up trying to get to somewhere is a way worse decision than just kind of flying controlled into you know a, le a little bit less optimal area let's say but was it bob hoover that said that the best thing to do is fly it all the way into the accident as far as you yeah, can keep flying through the crash right exactly yeah. cool um so this one i think we have to cover because i've had a couple now about the hey, public can i pause for a second you may pause for a second yeah, I mean, just uh, official end here. We, we will be glad to stick around and answer more questions. Let me just show. Our next episode is November 11th at 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern, and it's whether or to go or not. I know it features Pablo, I believe, right? No, uh, it's, that's Steve. Uh, Steve, Steve, Steve I know Bain. the fans. I know the fans want it. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. <laughs> But anyway, check us out for that one, and you will be, if you signed up for this one, you're automatically signed up, and there'll be a reminder email coming out. Anything I missed there, Keith, for that? No, we, we, yeah, we, we, we look forward to seeing you. So, uh, but okay. we, like, we're, like I said, we're going to sit here and answer some more questions if, if you all have questions. So what's next, Pablo? Do you have something for us? Yeah, so uh, NASA reports. This has been asked, mentioned, or commented on many times today. And so a lot of people are saying it's a free get-out-of-jail card, or it's the way to uh, – so the thoughts on that. So the, remember that the NASA report is, that's not so much an emergency thing. That's more of an issue of, I screwed up and broke a reg by accident. Remember, it was not a willful <laughs> violation. And so it's that get out of jail free card. You get to use it like once. I think it's every five years or something. Um, that's only for if like maybe I went and I accidentally busted airspace. Like I accidentally got into Bravo airspace and immediately got right back out. So then I can file that NASA report. Uh, to say like this was unintentional i didn't you know so whatever happened i can explain it and it's it was not me deciding that i'm just gonna you know forget the bravo i'm flying right through it it's 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 in my way that sort of thing so as long as it's an accidental and not on purpose you can use that but that really has nothing to do with emergencies if you have an emergency there's no issue there there's no nasa report to file it's get it down safely Hey, somebody's pointing out that it's no, is it November 12th? It's it's the it's on a Thursday. Is it the 12th or the 11th? Somebody check that for us. But somebody else is asking a question: is Why is it 270 degree turn? And it's because okay, so you know here's your runway right here. Okay, you take off and you turn. There's going to be some radius to that turn. You will not be lined up with the runway after a 180 degree turn. You've got to continue that turn, and then you're going to have to turn back. And so that's why you practice this sort of thing to to understand um, mm -hmm. that geometry. You know? Like I said, if you have access to a simulator, do it there. Yeah, because you can, and you can do, then of course you can do this also aloft at a safe altitude. I would definitely recommend with an instructor. And so it's that 180, and so it's the it's the 245. You got to do a 45 to sort of get back over to where the runway center line would be, and then another 45 to actually turn and actually line up with the runway. Yeah. Plus, it's going to give you that little extra safety buffer too. It's going to it's going to be a little more altitude you're going to lose in an extra 90 degrees. Um, and so that that should give you a decent altitude. And even then, you might decide to add a little bit more on. Um, and definitely practice with with an instructor on board. Practice with the angles of bank, because I find that a shallow turn it takes a lot longer, and a wider turn you lose a lot more altitude than if you just go a little steeper. Um, definitely turn it around faster. Yeah, 30 degrees is probably not going to do it. It's got to be like a 45 or something yep. like that. That's typically what I do. It's practice that 45 degree turn um, mm -hmm. with that. And you got to practice. You got to really practice that too, because you got to keep the nose down so you don't get in, yep. in danger of stalling or anything. All right. I guess I have one here that I think probably describes some of the things uh, we've been talking about. Uh, so I think in this case, it'll probably be like, probably not deciding if they made the right choice, but maybe just opinions on what should have or could have happened. So someone says on a night flight, someone else's tiger over a dark farm, seven miles out from an airport, 3,500 feet, total loss of oil pressure. He smelt the burning oil, rapidly rising engine temperatures, so on and so on. They contacted ACE, ATC. And describe the situation, including my question if I could make it back to the airport at best glide. With the glide established, engine failure check was complete. ATC asked if I wanted to declare an emergency. I asked what they meant. They said, if you declare, we'll activate emergency services, procedures, clear airspace. If you don't, we won't do those things. <laughs> uh, <laughs> except, you know, we don't contact the FAA. 
I was concerned with getting the plane owner in trouble and didn't see the advantage of declaring an emergency. Okay, so in that case, uh, you know, in hindsight, hopefully we're looking back and going, yes, declare the emergency, it's free, it doesn't cost anything. And the other thing you could do too is just to confirm, like you want those things, so please send out the trucks, send emergency services, bring them all to me, because landing in a field in the dark, I mean, did they say they were close enough to actually get back to the runway or they were gonna land in a field? I know they were gonna get back. Okay, they were gonna I mean, be able to that's make it back. Obviously, that's based on calculation, it's not real life. I think yeah. they got back. They didn't say they didn't, but hindsight's always easy, right? Thank God yeah. I didn't declare the emergency. Well, this is where that that thinking ahead, I think, is so important too. Is like make it. I would say that make it in your mind that if this happens to me, damn the paperwork. I'm declaring an emergency and roll the yeah. trucks. They, yeah. they, maybe they can. They they might appreciate the practice, even if nothing bad happens. Who knows? Yeah. Well, and the other thing too is just the layout of the situation. I think to myself, my God, if all of that was true. I mean, seven miles out, nighttime, 3,500 feet, someone else's plane, <laughs> like, right. you know, over a dark field. That's, That's when you fly it like a rental. <laughs> <laughs> Drive it like you stole it. <laughs> so, all right. Okay. What else? Um, all right. So one more. Uh, what do you suggest in cases of electrical failure with a 150 that's all fuses like ours? Troubleshooting fuses in flight doesn't seem practical, especially if you're solo. So I guess the thought there is that, is it a, a shorted out fuse that's causing the full electrical failure maybe? Um, I guess in that case, what I might try to do is turn the stuff off, maybe pull breakers that I think, I would think a breaker would like the, oh, the fuse would blow. So try to troubleshoot that, I get what they're saying. Help me out, because I've never flown an airplane or at least not, I, I well, should say know, that. I've never had an electrical you, flying in with a fuse in it. Unless you got somebody to help you out, just worry about flying the airplane. Yeah. Like, like I was saying, it's an electrical failure. Planes, uh, There's plenty of planes without electrical systems. You don't need electricity to fly your airplane. And I guess what I was getting at too is if a fuse blows, it's typically just going to blow the circuit just for that particular item. So unless you are in dire need of having it, you just keep flying and get it back on the ground. I'm just yeah. I'm trying to think of like maybe what if it was like in the RV12, what if it was the primary flight display or something that that went? Well, you, you know, still can fly. You know, that's what attitude. You fly. Maybe about. in that yeah. case, if I got somebody helping me, do I try to troubleshoot that if I'm at night? Yeah. All right. That's where that's where it's important to learn how to like also learn what the airplane feels like at certain speeds and everything. Know what know what it feels like on final, so you can kind of estimate your speed if you don't have that readout. So. Uh, and I did say last one, so that, that was the last kind of question comment. There's there's a couple of things, you know, there's a lot of instances people are asking about which are specific, like what what should you do in a bird strike? Well, I think I think the emergencies all basically come down to, you know, maintain control, right? Um, right. Figure out what's going on, and then if you have to land as soon as possible. Uh, but uh, is there maybe something to wrap that up to kind of combine all of these specific situations? Prior preparation prevents performance <laughs> is that the five p's is that six p's yeah there's something like that yeah. <laughs> so I, to me like i said at the very beginning um i think that the the lesson that i would say to take away from here is is that idea of if you are you are going to fly like you train so then train like you want to fly um, and the point is be prepared to build these habits be aware because i i know i definitely and i have to fight the complacency myself as a pilot too um, that's why I used to go through all those the, the procedures and things like that when I was flying freight because I know I, one of the things I know I lost right away was not the, the knowledge of regs like VFR regs when I started flying professionally I was flying I them I couldn't remember any of that stuff anymore because I wasn't using it so for the emergency procedures those are ones and the system stuff were things that I knew that I didn't want to go away because I knew how important they were for safety so yeah so just make a point of being prepared think about these things that can happen and, and also look at your accident case study so that you can also be aware of things that you wouldn't anticipate happening. Because the more you can do that, the better prepared you can be for when something bad might happen. All right, Chris, good job. Well, we, once cool. again, we just really enjoy having you here on Thursday. And the next one is on Thursday, November 12th at noon 12th. Eastern. We look forward to seeing you there and we will be talking about weather. And so until then, um, if you have any questions, let us know. All right, cool, thanks guys. Bye. Thank All right, guys, Steven, let's let's turn it off, buddy. All right, here we go. There it is.